management of acute pericarditis. The scenario is as follows. Mr. Philip Brown, a 26-year-old student, was admitted due to sharp chest pain radiating to the neck. Immediately here, we would stop and go through the potential causes of this chest pain. They include acute pericarditis, acute coronary syndrome, angina, pneumothorax, pneumonia, pulmonary embolism, esophagitis, esophageal spasm, and musculoskeletal pain. At this stage, although we know the patient su suffers from pericarditis as this is the case in practice prior to investigation, it is very difficult to rule out any of the differentials completely based on the history. Mr. Brown further adds that the pain was central in sight. Onset is during the last few hours. He describes it as sharp, radiating to the neck. He also says that he has been suffering from a cold infection for the last few days. The pain is constant, made worse by movement, and he classes it as a 7 out of 10. So, as in any patient, we will follow the A, B, C, D, E's of initial in assessment, starting with the airway. Does this patient need airway support? In this case, no, he does not. Moving on to the, moving on, we can then perform a full respiratory examination on the patient. Here, we can um, make a pneumothorax less likely of a diagnosis, as can pneumonia and pleural effusion, based on hyperresonance and dullness, respectively. Tachypnea and tachycardia, if present, would allude to pulmonary embolism, although this patient has no risk factors for the condition, therefore unlikely. Moving on to the cardiovascular examination, here we would assess the pulse, blood pressure, capillary refill time and carry out a full cardiovascular exam sending on bloods. Pericardial friction rub was heard, would be heard in peri pericarditis and muffled heart sounds together with JVP increase and high potential would point towards cardiac tamponade. At this point we would also check the GCS and blood sugar which are normal and then we would also carry out an abdominal examination and the temperature which would be normal. Initial investigations to close in to the diagnosis include um, taking bloods, um, using ease would be elevated in uremic pericarditis and ESR, CRP along with WCC give us an idea of information going on and troponins are elevated in ACS though modest elevations are also seen in pericarditis. The chest x-ray itself may be completely normal and help exclude pneumothorax and pneumonia from the picture. If a pericardial effusion is present, it will lead to the classic water bottle sign seen. Here is a water bottle. The ECG in pericarditis goes through several stages in a patient, although 50% of patients do not go through these stages at all. Stage 1 includes widespread ST elevation. Stage 2 includes PR depression with ST segment returning to normal. This PR depression is highly suggestive of pericarditis. Stage 3 has T-wave inversions and stage 4 returns back to normal. Here is an example ECG. As you can see, we have widespread ST elevations and PR depressions in several leads. An echo is also useful to rule, rule out valve abnormalities and may show pericardial effusion in 10% of cases. May also show tamponade, but this is a clinical diagnosis. To sum up, we have a 26-year-old male with chest pain radiating to the neck, no significant past medical history, and suffered from a previous cold infection. We could rule out ACS angina from the ECG and the echo would have alluded to any damage to the heart from an MI. On examination, no dullness or hyperresonance noted, removing respiratory pathology. Pericardial friction rub is present. Chest x ray was normal. ECG characteristic of pericarditis. Therefore, it is likely that this patient, and he does in this case, have viral pericarditis. How do we manage acute pericarditis then? So, to begin with, always we adjust the airway. If oxygen is required, we give it. Principally, we give high doses of ibuprofen, 300 mg to 600 mg, 6 to 8 hours hourly, depending on the severity of the pain. This can be stepped up following the WHO pain ladder, adding cocodamol, 30 to 500 for example. Colchicine can also be added if required or used by itself as a secondary agent, 0.5 mg or twice daily. It is also important not to forget about gastric protection such as omeprazole. Assess the risk of the patient of developing clots. 
and reassess the patient after medication. Definitive treatment includes to taper the NSAIDs as the patient improves. It takes a few days to a few weeks for a patient to improve with viral pericarditis. Pericardiocentesis is mandatory in a patient with cardiac tamponade and should be considered in bacterial or neoplastic pericarditis. So that's it for assessment and management of acute pericarditis. Uh, if you guys do have any questions, please leave them in the comment section below. If you have any topics that you'd like us to cover, please also leave a comment. Thanks again for watching.